Now, CGT. The capital gain tax. The capital gain tax is basically applicable on both individual. An individual has to pay as well as the corporation. That shows the importance of this topic, that this topic is applicable on an individual as well as corporation. So what exactly when CGT is applicable? So CGT is applicable when there is a chargeable disposal and chargeable disposal of a chargeable asset. So important thing is there must be a chargeable disposal, not an exempt disposal and a chargeable asset, not an exempt assets. So we have the list of those assets which are exempt. If you sell that assets, then there will be no CGT. Similarly, we have few exempt disposal. If this is the case, then there will be no CGT. So exempt disposal as well as exempt assets. Let me tell you a few exempt assets. You have to memorize few. Let me tell you few that uh, uh, qualifying corporate bonds. Similarly, the guilds, the government securities, as well as the vesting chattels. Similarly, the motor car. So all these disposal, if you dispose of all these assets, which I'm mentioning here, then there will be no CGT. And the list is going on. Similarly, there you can say that uh, main residence, if you are selling your main residence, then you can get some exemptions or uh, investment, which is held in and ISA. Remember that the interest or dividend received from ISA is also exempt as well as any kind of uh, disposal, if you are gaining, uh, getting any gain, then this is also being exempt. Similarly, the NSNI certificates. So national saving and investment certificates, if there is any interest from these certificates, then these interest is also exempt as well as any gain from NSNI certificates. So I have written few exempt assets you can see the list from the from your notes from your study text the complete list of all those assets now once an individual or a corporation dispose of any asset first of all we have to find out the gain and then we have to accumulate all the gain and losses and then we have to find out taxable gain so first of all let's talk about in the case of an individual, that how we can calculate the gain on the disposal of asset. So you need to learn the pro forma carefully for an individual, right? So first of all, we have to identify the sale proceed. What is the value of the asset dispose of the sale proceed? And from that sales proceed, we have to deduct any selling cost. Selling cost is always allowable cost. So we'll deduct the selling cost and we'll get the net sales proceed. This is the net sales proceed. And from that net sales proceed, we'll deduct the acquisition cost. This is a capital expenditure as well as any cost which is incidental to acquisition like transportation cost or other cost and similarly if there is any upgradation cost or a kind of 
enhancement cost will also deduct these cost from here. So as a result, once you deduct the cost from these net sales proceed, there will be there will be a value which is called either chargeable gain or allowable loss. So this is the basic pro forma of the calculation of gain or loss. So for every individual asset, first we have to identify gain or loss on an individual basis. For every individual asset. And then we have to use another performa in which we aggregate all the gain and losses. The second thing is combine all the gain and losses. For example, we have one disposal resulted in a gain of 50,000. We have another disposal re resulted in a loss of 10,000. So we have a net gain of 40,000. And always remember that the current year losses are to be offset with current year gain. This is an idea of the loss relief in capital gain tax. And this is mandatory that you have to deduct your current year losses with all your current year gain. And then we'll deduct annual exemption. The annual exemption has been given to us in the tax sheet. And that annual exemption for tax year 21-22 is 12,300. And this annual exemption is only available for individual. And this is not applicable when you try to calculate the corporation CGT. This is not applicable on companies. So after annual exemption, if we get any amount, like in my example, this is 27,700. This is the value after deduction of annual exemption. Now, I will deduct one more thing that is the broad forward capital losses. And it is mandatory that the broad forward losses to be deducted from this value after annual exemption. So the for, pro forma is very important. And now we'll get a figure of taxable gain. This is the taxable gain figure. And on this figure, we have to apply the tax rate. We have to calculate CGT by applying the rate. So we'll apply the tax rate on this. and you will get the CGT figure. Now, from this CGT figure, we'll always deduct one thing, that is payment on account. Now, why payment on account? This payment on account is against residential property. If there is any gain against residential property, then you have to pay tax, advance tax you have to pay and the limit is you have to pay tax within 30 days of the disposal. You have to file return to tax authority within 30 days of the disposal of the residential property, and you have to pay within 30 days. So this advanced tax is to be offset against your final liability and you will get a figure of CGT payable. This is the final figure with that we need to pay to the tax authority. Now see the pro forma again. First identify gain of the year, then identify loss of the year, net gain figure, then deduct annual exemption, then deduct any broad forward capital losses, and then you will get the taxable gain apply tax rate and you will get CGT, then deduct payment on account if any. 
If there is any payment on account, then deduct that payment on account. So what is the rule of capital losses? The losses rule is that offset against current year gain first. And if any loss left, then brought forward losses. The next year, you can use that losses. So in case of capital losses, we don't have any carry back treatment available right now. So first of all, current year losses can be offset with current year gain and brought forward losses to be offset after the annual exemption. Now, what are the tax rates and how are we going to apply the tax rate on taxable gain? As we are discussing the individual CGT, so this is basically connected with the income tax rate. So the rates, as far as the rates are concerned, that will be given to you in the tax sheet. There are two kinds of rates given. One is related with normal, other is with residential property. And uh, the lower limit of the normal is 10%. And for residential property, it's 18%. And the higher limit, it's 20%. And it's 28%. Means if you are selling a residential property, then you have to apply 18 or 28%. If you are selling other than residential property, the rates are 10% or 20% up to the lower limit. So suppose, for example, uh, say suppose, for example, my taxable gain related with the other than residential property other than residential property, my taxable gain is suppose 50,000. So how I am going to apply these 10% and 20% on this 50,000. So remember that we have a basic band available and that basic band limit is starting from one pound to 37,700 given to you in the tax sheet. This is the basic band. And this basic band is also used in the income tax calculation. The same basic band which we used in the income tax calculation, we have to use it here, right? Now, I have 50,000 of taxable gain and my band is 37,700. So that means up to 37,700, I have to apply 10%. That means the remaining value after the deduction of 50,000, the leftover is 12,300. And now I'm going to apply the higher rate, which is 20%. So this is 3770. And we have 2460. So this is my CGT liability six two three zero this is my cgt liability and if that taxable gain was related with residential property the same rule is applicable up to thirty seven thousand seven hundred eighteen percent and on above we will apply 28 percentage one thing one important thing is that this particular band might be increased. This might be increased in case you have gross personal pension contribution. So suppose, for example, you have 10,000 of gross PPC in your question. Then what would be the band? Now the band will increase by the gross PPC. And now my band is up to 47,700. That is from one 
247,700, the rate is either 10% or the rate is 18%. Now see another thing, suppose for example, an individual has taxable income, which is income tax income, taxable income is uh, like 20,000 and we have taxable gain, which is suppose 60,000 pound. And this is normal, not related with residential property the normal gain. Now, if you have taxable income, then your band will first utilize that taxable income. Means out of 37,700, utilize 20,000 first, and the remaining band limit is available now, 17,700. So it happens that if you have taxable income more than 37,700, then the lower limit of CGT is not applicable. Now in this question, I have 17,700 left over. So I'll apply 10%, that is 1770. And on X's, I will apply 20,000. So what is my value? value is 42,300 and this is higher rate and this is 20 percent that is 8460 and overall my liability is 10230 cgt so this is how we'll apply the overall tax rates on CGT. So starting from the beginning, first of all, you should learn what are the exempt assets, then how to calculate gain on individual asset, then a combined pro forma, how to calculate taxable gain, and then how to apply the relevant tax rates. Sometime it happens that in maybe you have both normal gain as well as the gain from the residential property. So question is from where to offset annual exemption and brought forward losses? What is the most beneficial way? Always remember that you need to find out the most beneficial way, you need to find out the most beneficial way savings so if in a question, you have both normal gain as well as the residential property gain, and uh, you have to offset the annual exemption and brought forward losses, then first against residential property. Use these two against residential property. Why? Why from residential property? Because the residential property rate is quite higher as compared to normal gain. So as a result, my tax liability will be saved. Okay. Now, payment on account. What is payment on account? This payment on account, which is an advanced tax, is deducted against residential property and you must report tax authority within 30 days. This is the notification period. Must report within 30 days and pay relevant liability against the residential property. But sometimes, if there is a disposal of the residential property and you anticipate that there will be no tax, you might get relief, then there is no need to file a return as well as no need to pay against that. And this is an estimation, right? You will use estimation in order to find out this POA payment on account. 
Now, what is the due date of other assets? Due date is important. Due date of final CGT liability. And this is 31st January following tax year. Do remember this date following tax year. And my tax year starts from 6th April 21 and it ends at 5th April 22. This is the tax year 21 and 22. So if there is any disposal in this year, my CGT payment date is 31st January after the tax year, that is 31st January 23. This is the final CGT payment liability. And this is to be submitted as a self-assessment tax. Now let's move forward. Let's discuss a few further things in this particular topic. Let's talk about chattels. Sometimes we dispose of an item and that item falls in the heading of chattels. So what is chattels? Chattels are tangible, movable property. Any item which is tangible as well as movable will fall into this category. And there are two types of chattels. One is vesting chattels and another is non vesting chattels. What is the definition of uh, a vesting asset? A vesting asset is having life 50 or less years. That is called a vesting asset. Now, few examples of vesting assets and few examples of non-vesting assets. So, vesting might be like, uh, for example, race horse, like boat. Non-vesting might be jewelry. antique item, paintings, these fall in non-vesting chattels. Now, in, in, one important rule is that the vesting chattels are exempt for CGT. If there is any vesting chattel, you are disposing of any vesting chattels, these are generally exempt. There is no tax. But there is one exception. If that exception is applicable, then we have to decide whether it is taxable or not. One exception. Keep in mind that vesting assets are usually exempt. But if that exception apply, then it might be a possibility that there will be a taxable one. And as far as the non-vesting chattel is concerned, we have to apply 6,000 rule. And this 6,000 rule says that, number one, where selling price is more than 6,000, and cost of asset is also more than 6,000. This is rule number one. Here, if this is the case, then normal calculation. Like I told you that how to calculate gain, that is selling price minus cost, find out gain or loss. And the second rule where selling price is less than equal to 6,000 and cost is less than equal to 6,000. And in this case, this is a non-vesting chattel 
and this type of non-vesting chattel is also exempt. So in short, we have vesting chattels which are exempt and we have non-vesting chattels as per 6,000 rules and these are exempt as well. Now, what is the exception? And when this exception is applicable and what are the consequences of this exception? And this is basically applicable on those vesting chattels which are held as at as plant and machinery eligible for capital allowances means you are selling an item on which you have already claimed capital allowances so in that case if you are claiming capital allowances then there might be two consequences one is sold at gain this might be sold at gain another is sold at loss sold at gain means selling price is more than cost and sold at loss means selling price is lower than cost now very simple rule if you have a vesting chattel which is a plant and machinery and you get some gain then this is taxable now this is no longer exempt this is taxable and normal calculation is needed but if we have a loss situation then there is no gain and no loss so let me remind you again the whole rule that chattels are tangible movable property means intangible asset cannot be chattels fixed plant and machinery cannot be a chattel it must be tangible and movable and there are two categories vesting and non-vesting vesting chattels are usually exempt non-vesting we have to apply 6000 rule and in case of vesting chattel we have to apply a rule on plant and machinery eligible for capital allowances that if there is a gain the gain is taxable and if there is loss then no gain no loss calculation another thing other vesting assets those are not classified as chattels other than chattels take an example intangible asset the vesting intangible asset now in case of a vesting intangible asset what we need to do we have to use selling price of the asset and then we have to deduct the allowable cost and this might be gain or loss now how to calculate this allowable cost this allowable cost is to be calculated as cost of the original item multiply by remaining life of the asset how many years left over total life of asset technically this is cost minus depreciation that is the book value for example let me put the numbers here for example we have purchased a vesting asset at a price of 50000 on 1st january 2016 its life was estimated as 10 years it was sold on 1st January 2020 and the price is suppose 60,000 calculate gain 
So let me just calculate this working allowable cost. So my total cost is 50,000. Remaining life and my total life is 10 years. So I have started on 1st January 16 and sold on 1st January 20. It means 16, 17, 18, 19. So I have four years, four complete years. So remaining life is six. So the allowable one is into six divided by 10. So my allowable cost is 30,000. This is the allowable cost. Now the selling price is 60,000. Selling price is 60,000 minus the allowable cost, which is 30,000. And we have a gain of 30,000. This is the So an easy calculation that you need to identify cost and then allowable expense, you can easily identify gain or losses. Moving forward. Sometime it happens that if you try to sell any item and you want to get some relief, I'm, I'm incorporating relief in between not discussing all the relief at once, rather I'm discussing with the other topics. So let's talk about one of the relief that we will get in case of disposal of the asset. Relief number one, a very important relief. And that is the rollover relief. important topic roll over relief whenever you dispose of any asset there is a possibility that you can ask tax authority about that is there any relief available so there are so many reliefs available and relief is one of the most important topic under cgt be be careful you should learn this topic carefully the topic of relief so let's talk about the roll over relief also known as replacement of business assets relief. An important thing is that this is applicable to individual as well as this is also applicable for corporations because not every relief is applicable to corporation, but this is available for corporation as well. Now I'm talking about the individual first, that how an individual can get rollover relief. So first of all, individual sell a qualifying asset. An individual dispose of a qualifying asset, number one. Then what to do in order to get this relief? then you reinvest the proceed of that qualifying asset into another asset, another qualifying asset. So this is the main condition that in order to get rollover relief, what you have to do, suppose I have sold one asset at a price of 300,000, then I have to reinvest at least 300,000 in order to get 100% roll over relief. And I have to make this decision within qualifying time period. So this is the main concept behind the roll over relief. So what are the consequences? What is exactly roll over relief? So rollover relief means any gain on disposal of this asset is to be deferred. 
not exempt till then till the disposal of the new asset what is the benefit for the individual the individual will get some time to settle the cgt liability but remember that you have to claim this it's not automatic you have to claim this particular rollover relief and if partial amount is reinvested then the partial ror will be available now suppose for example there is a disposal of asset and disposal proceed is suppose 400000 and as a result of disposal there is a gain of uh, like 50000 now we bought new asset at a price of suppose 480000 now see how we can calculate and identify the rollover relief and the subsequent disposal how gain can be calculated so first of all see we have a gain how much 50000 can we get rollover relief yes because disposal proceed is 400000 and the new asset has been bought at 480 more than that so 100% rollover relief is available and this is optional not mandatory if you want to pay tax now it's up to you but i i have opted so no gain nothing now what is the cost of new asset the new asset cost me 4 lakh 80000 what i have to do is to deduct the rollover relief from here how much rollover relief 50000 so this 430000 is called the base cost of new asset which is to be used in the subsequent disposal when i sell subsequently it then i have to use the base cost now what is the qualifying qualifying asset condition which assets are eligible for this roll over relief so next thing is we should you, you should remember is qualifying asset there are three items that is called qualifying asset for roll over relief purpose one is the disposal of the goodwill for an unincorporated business unincorporated business not for company the second thing is that uh, fixed plant and machinery this is a qualifying asset and third thing is land and building so suppose if you sell a land and building and reinvest in fixed plant and machinery then the condition has been satisfied so both the old asset and the new asset must be a qualifying asset and must be used for business purpose now what about qualifying time period qualifying time zone so you have to sell one you have to acquire one and the total qualifying period is 4 years that is how many months total 4 years comprises of so that is 36 months and the breakup is that 3 years after the disposal and one year before disposal for example let me just make it easy this is the case 
for example and uh, we are talking about that uh, suppose uh, i know the disposal date suppose i know the disposal date so how can i find out the difference as a result of disposal date so see my disposal date is suppose 1st january 2020 now what is the three year date and what is the one year before date so three year date is the maximum is january 21 22 23 so it's 31st december 2023 have to purchase by the end of 31st december 2023 20 21 22 not 23 it must be 22 and then beginning it's 1st january 2019 so starting from this you can see from 19 till 22 it's four year 19 20 21 and 22 so how these four years have been given one year before disposal you can buy and three years after so qualifying time period must be satisfied yeah sure you will get this notes as well don't worry about it you will get this no the qualifying time period is that clear now sometime it happens that you are not able to get the 100 person roll over then there is concept of partial roll over relief and when you will get if all of the sale proceed is not being utilized then you can't use all the roll over but partial roll over is available now suppose for example the disposal proceed is suppose disposal proceed is suppose 400000 and uh, gain is suppose 40000 and investment in a qualifying asset is suppose not 400000 it's 3 lakh 80000 so how much roll over is available now not 100% so some gain is chargeable and the rest of the gain can be deferred as roll over relief so chargeable gain is chargeable gain is that is lower of full gain amount not reinvested So in my example, the full gain is forty thousand, and amount not reinvested. I disposed of the asset as four hundred thousand and purchase at three lakh eighty thousand. So amount not disposed of is twenty thousand. So how much is the lower of value? The lower of value is twenty thousand. So this twenty thousand is the chargeable gain. Immediate gain is twenty thousand. so my working is like that i have a gain of 40000 deduct ror as a balancing figure how the chargeable one is i have identified the chargeable one as 20000 so the difference is ror which is 20000 the balancing figure now new asset cost me new asset cost me 3 lakh 80000 deduct ror that is 20000 and the base cost of the asset is now 3 lakh 60000 this is the base cost 
So remember the point, the whole concept. Let me revise that whole concept. If you are selling one qualifying asset and using the proceed of that qualifying asset into the new qualifying asset within a qualifying time period, then you have an option that you can skip the gain for the time being. That is the deferral of the gain, which is also known as rollover relief, which might be 100% rollover relief or it might be partial rollover relief, right? Now, another concept in that, this is a kind of a deferral and this deferral is taxable when you subsequently dispose of new asset. So till that time, you have to wait and on the disposal of new asset, you have to pay tax on old asset as well as the new asset. But sometime it happens that you are selling a depreciating asset or you are buying a depreciating asset, a qualifying asset, but that qualifying asset is a depreciating asset. Then what would be the consequences? Now, what is a depreciating asset here? A depreciating asset is vesting asset. That is life 50 or less. And the second condition is that an asset that becomes vesting within 10 years. And it means that within 10 years means the total life is 60 years. The most common example is here, it might be leased hold land and building. This is leased hold land and building. Eligible for this rule. Now, if you sell a qualifying asset, acquire any qualifying asset, which is a depreciating asset, then can you get rollover relief? Now, no rollover. Rollover relief is not possible now. Rather than the gain is only deferred. Only deferred. Till when? You will get a time period. You can wait for the payment, but till when? So it is, the rule is earliest of. All these rules which I'm writing, if you know the theory, there are lots of theory in the exam and you have to produce rule. So if you know the rule, that means you can easily get the theoretical marks. So what is the rule? Earliest of these three things whichever occur first, you have to pay tax on this depreciating asset because we are deferring till the earliest of. Number one, disposal of depreciating asset, the replacement asset, depreciating asset. Ten years from acquisition of asset or the third thing is that depreciating asset cease to be used. whichever is earlier, whichever is earlier. Now, suppose for example, I have sold one item 
on 1st January 2020 and purchased a depreciating asset on 1st January 2021. Now, earliest of these three events, you can count from here that the disposal of depreciating asset, the cessation of depreciating asset, and 10 years from acquisition of asset. Now count, what is 10 year? It's uh, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, and it's 30. So it's 1, 1, 2, 0, 3, 0, the 10 year limit. This gain might be deferred till 1st January 2030. So the difference is that in case of a normal qualifying asset, there is a concept of deferral and the concept of base cost of an asset. In the case of depreciating asset, there is only deferral and there is no base cost asset example. So this is the end of the roll over relief. The first relief I have completed, that is roll over relief. A very important one, not that difficult, just basic rules. If you remember that basic rules, you can easily hit that particular topic. Now, Little bit about today, the leftover time we have, little bit about the discussion of the valuation of shares. And in the next agenda then, I will cover something related to shares, merger and acquisitions, and then some more reliefs. And then, then we'll start practicing the CGT question from the computer-based platform. But as I told you, that there are rules on individual as well as corporation. So let me just tell you that there are a few differences in CGT which related to corporation. Let me tell you some differences so that we can learn this along with individual. Suppose a company is disposing of a chargeable asset. So how the company will calculate CGT? First thing is pro forma. Is there any separate pro forma? Answer is yes. There is a difference between the individual's pro forma and the company's pro forma. That is going to be start from the same. That is selling price. We deduct the selling cost. And this is the net disposal proceed. And then similar thing, deduct the acquisition cost, the purchase cost, inclusive of transaction cost, deduct this. If there is any additional cost, which is capital expenditure, deduct this as well. And now, previously that was chargeable gain. But in case of corporation, this is not chargeable gain. This is called unindexed gain. That is gain before inflation. In case of corporation CGT, there is a concept of inflation. Unindexed gain, this is before inflation. So we'll deduct the impact of inflation, which is called indexation allowance. This is basically indexation allowance. And if there is a positive balance, then this is going to be chargeable gain. And you know, there is no annual exemption in case of corporation so this gain will be transferred to the main pro forma of company. And you will aggregate all the income of the company 
and the rate of CGT is only 19%. There is no classification like uh, the residential property or other than that. In case of company, there is only one thing, one single rate that is 19% applicable on this. And what about capital losses? Like an individual, the same rule, current year loss offset with current year gain. Current year loss offset with current year gain. If there is any unrelieved loss, then use brought forward. The capital loss cannot be offset with other income of the company. And there is no kind of annual exemption or kind of thing in the case of company. So this is the basic difference between the corporation and the individual. And also remember that this indexation is limited to the 31st December 2017. It's up to 2017 is available. So whenever you need to calculate inflation, the inflation must be calculated till 31st December 2017 and for which you will be given in the question indexation factor. And we have to use indexation factor that how to calculate the inflation and how to adjust the inflation. But this indexation is only available against gain. An indexation cannot be available against loss. An indexation cannot create loss. It will not give you any figure regarding that. So if there is any gain, then you will offset gain against the inflation and the remaining gain is taxable. 